the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. For his right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Sing unto the Lord a new song. For he hath done marvelous things. And I saw the light. Well, I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night, now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Let's sing it one more time as we stand. And I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more, Lord, I saw the light. God is greater than my problems, let's sing out this morning, amen. God is greater than my problems and greater than my fears. He is greater than my failings and faithful through the years. God is greater than me and every human plan. Every word of God will always be greater. Lord Creator, God of wonders, high above all amen God is greater Lord creator God of wonders high above all things he is the king of kings let's sing it one more time church God is greater God is greater than my problems and greater than my fears he and the enemy and every human plan every word of god will always stand of magic lowers high above all things god He is the King of Kings. Yes, amen. Thank God for Jesus. We come into your presence to sing a song to you, amen. Father of creation, amen. To sing a song to you, a song of praise and honor for all the things. Song to you, a song of praise and honor for all the things you've helped us through is you're the father you're the father of creation the risen lamb of day and you set your people free with love and live i can walk with you every night and every day we come into your presence to sing a song to you a song of praise and honor for all the things you helped us through worship you lord god we praise your mighty name god of god we thank god's throne uh, in prayer this morning we want to believe god uh, to pray uh, for the harvest field that God would continue to move in and Kim Rivera I uh, want to lift them up in Burbank California uh, we want to pray for the leaders of our fellowship uh, for Pastor Greg Mitchell uh, the other leaders of our fellowship that God would can pray for our service this morning God would speak to hearts that God would change lives this morning uh, so we're gonna pray for God's ministering spirit Again, we want to pray for the situation in Ukraine. Uh, we want to be protected by uh, what's happening. We want to pray for their safety and that God, again, would bring 
uh, divine intervention. So uh, we're going to believe God for every need, uh, those needs joining us on YouTube as well. We want to lift up uh, your needs as well this morning. So uh, we want to pray that God would move uh, after a season of prayer. I'm going to ask if uh, Johnny Gooding uh, could open us up in prayer. So God, we love you. God, we pray that you would move, that you would touch lives and souls. God, we pray, God, for every need. Heavenly Father, God, we humbly come. Father, God, these that need a touch from you in their lives, Father, God, in their finances, God, in their, in their relationships, Father, God, in their families in Bullhead City, God. God, for the stewards in Phoenix, Father, God, for the Riveras in Burbank, California, God. God, we pray now for our baby works that are in church right now, Father, God, that you're a fresh outpouring of anointing, God, upon these services, God. God, that you would move mightily, Father, God, across this nation, Father, God. God, that your hand would be evident father god in these issues going on around the world father god god and that you would get the glory father god when it has changed god receive all that you would have for us this day god in jesus mighty name amen Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. amen you may agree we're seated this morning uh we're excited for this day we're excited for all that god has for us uh we're excited everyone has joined us uh, we're excited for those joining us on YouTube as well. Uh, we're just thankful that we're able to do this. Uh, it's a great blessing to be in the house of God. Uh, we do want to remind you, though, service at 5 o'clock, so we'll open up the doors at 5 for prayer. We do in p.m. Uh, for uh, prayer service. So uh, we do want to remind you we do have a revival coming up. Uh, this will be March 27th through the 30th. Uh, this will be with uh, J.W. Ballinger, so we're excited about that. Uh, we just ended a great uh, revival service with Pastor Stevens, uh, and we're going to expect great things again. Uh, that's March 27th through 30th, so please uh, mark that down in your calendars. And we do want to remind you that we do have a water baptism. interested in that, we do encourage you, uh, if you do plan on uh, participating, uh, bring an extra set of clothes for that. Uh, bring a towel uh, this evening. Uh, we do want to remind you there is a, a viewing service for Mike Adams. This is uh, uh, taking place Wednesday the 9th, and this will be at uh, 1.30 at Lamont, and then the celebration service at 3 o'clock, and that will take place at the First Baptist in my offering. Uh, as our ushers come this morning, God, we do thank you, God. Name in their Arizona, so uh, please remember that as well. So we want to receive this morning's uh, offering, and as offering, how many know that uh, with all that's going on across the world or with the world right now, uh, that it's a uh, uh, it makes it seem even a, you know it's an un way right now uh, with everything that's going on. Uh, there's no confidence in in the world powers. There's no confidence uh, in, in a lot of things today. But how many know that? Uh, have a hope and we do have a confidence and that comes in Jesus Christ see Hebrews 12 28 says therefore since uh, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken or not uh, not as the Bible says uh, we understand that through this very act of worship uh, through our giving that we can uh, apply God's grace that we can apply God's power to it uh, over our finances and on top of that uh, how many know that we become laborers uh, with Christ and accelerate the work of God that is happening right now? Uh, to have confidence as we give in, in an unknown world that we live in, give, uh, continue to give, continue to be. If I could have uh, Jonathan uh, bless the gift and the giver this morning. Church, let's sing that song. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice. 
rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, and this is the day, this is the day that the Lord sing unto the Lord a new song. He hath done marvelous deeds for His right hand and His holy arm. Gotten Him the victory and sing unto. Thank you for your giving. That is a great blessing. It's why we're able to do all that we can do here. And uh, without you, without you uh, online, without all of you who give, it would be uh, very difficult, very difficult. And uh, we appreciate your offerings and your gifts. Amen. John chapter 1, if you have a Bible this morning, appreciate the Sunday school. Amen. A great, uh, great uh, opportunity to learn. And uh, John will continue that next Sunday morning as well. And so uh, don't miss that. Uh, uh, John chapter 1, if you have a Bible, amen. Water baptism tonight, amen. And so don't, don't space it out. Don't forget. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Don't let your cousin uh, drive you down to the valley for a cinnamon or something. Uh, and so uh, just be here uh, and uh, bring us a change of clothes and, uh, and you, amen, and a towel, and that will be a great blessing. Uh, the, the nativity, the uh, birth of Jesus, we celebrate at Christmas, of course, uh, that was only the beginning of a rather long work uh, in the life of Christ uh, and uh, we've uh, looked at uh, one part of the dynamic. We've looked at one aspect of the incarnation, the Christ who came to dwell within us, uh, form us, fashion us by his Holy Spirit, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit uh, in us, in our inner being. And uh, I spent some time with that uh, a number of weeks ago, a couple of few weeks ago, uh, but today I want to look at a further meaning of the incarnation, incarnate. Uh, many of you recognize that, in the flesh, okay? And uh, so that's how Jesus came, uh, clothed in the human flesh, veiled, uh, hidden in the human flesh, uh, the curtain, the veil of human flesh. And uh, if we're going to look back on the Old Testament, uh, it says he tabernacled among us, and that is he dwelt with the children of Israel in the Old Testament. He dwelt, God dwelt with them. Uh, he was between the cherubim in the Holy of Holies, behind the curtains of the tabernacle, beyond the fence that surrounded the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. And no man was allowed to approach on fear of death. One man collecting sticks uh, uh, was killed just because he collected sticks on the Sabbath. Uh, and so no man was allowed to approach uh, the consecrated, the anointed place, uh, except the anointed and chosen priesthood and, their priesthood and their servants who cared for the tabernacle. Uh, it was God's abiding presence. It led them. It dwelt with them wherever they went. And more than that, Jesus, he was born of a woman. He increased, according to Luke, in wisdom, stature, in favor with God and men. He marked out conflicts and uncertainties of this life. He marked out a path for us, hallowed every place along the way. He chose if we could say it this way, Jesus chose to be less rather than more. He chose no privilege. He refused nothing appointed for man to go through. He did not desire to be spared any burden or any dimension of the mortal state. He accepted the things that came his way. He didn't hurry through anything, but rather chose to be among us. He came to experience the reality that he was flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. 
I remember the last trip I took uh, to Israel was with Pastor Mitchell. He was on that trip. And uh, the rest of the pilgrims, I, I went with them as well. But Pastor Mitchell at that time was not at the peak of his energy. They told Pastor Cox, I want to see and do everything. And Jesus was that way on his pilgrimage to this planet. Not at the peak of his throne in glory, but choosing to be less rather than more and denying privilege rather than accepting it. He came in order that we might see and know that Jesus made himself to be one of us, living, feeling, buffeted, tempted like us, yet without sin. And listen to me. We're not off the hook. Because a lot of times we look at the miracles and the things that Jesus did, and we say, of course, he was God. No sweat for him. No big deal. No big deal. Of course, he was God. But I'm not God. So the demands are too much. They're too hard, too beyond what a mere human can do. And seriously, think about what it must have been for him. What it must have been for him to do as he did to save and bless all of humankind. The salvation for all of humankind he paid for on Calvary. For him, think about what it is for him to open such a road of perfection and opportunity to us who believe. And seriously, we cannot just escape obligation, duty, responsibility by saying, well, of course, he was God. John 1.14 the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for Your great, great sacrifice on our behalf, in our stead, in our place. Lord God, we thank You. I pray, Lord God, the reality of your work, the desire and the reason and the being of your work would land in our hearts and minds that we'd not disappoint you, but live and give glory to your name. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. It can't be a small thing for our Creator to become as a man. It can't be a small thing for him to become closer and more intimately connected to us, a human destiny that included death. That's included in human destiny. It can't be a small thing to be a human with the honor that he once had being placed as the creator, God in the bosom of the Father, can't be a small thing for him to come as a man. And so in our scripture, it says he dwelt among us. And I think as John the Apostle writes that, I think he's making a reference to the Old Testament and the Shekinah glory of God. That is, of course, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, it refers to the indwelling or the dwelling of God in the midst of the encamped and traveling people of God. That is, God went wherever they went and camped wherever they camped in the Holy of Holies over the mercy seat between the outstretched wings of the cherubim. The temple in the Old Testament, later place of God, of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses 
was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud, the glory of God rested upon it and filled the tabernacle. When they dedicated the temple, God came to establish his presence there. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Then the house, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. The glory that filled the tabernacle, priests, so that Moses could not minister. That glory came and dwelt among us, not they and dwelt among us, they was human. The indwelling was a person that was divine. It, in it, Christ is realized. The actual presence of God came and dwelt among humanity. It was a personal appearance and participation of God. He came and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And John's background for that phrase was the covenant that God cut with the children of Israel. Bounded the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In the end to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. And in the message translation, God, God, a God of mercy and grace, endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true. How tremendous this visitation of God to us. John would also be aware of David's oft-said prayers, John 4 or Psalm 411. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. John's thought is the redeeming love of God. He's thinking of a rather broad sweep. He's not just translating like one verse or out of context. He's coming to a conclusion of all that, jo that Jesus came to do, all that Jesus intended to do. He's thinking about the love that's manifested for undeserving people. Jesus' love that wept over the grave of of his friend that wept over the sorrows of the city of Jerusalem. It was the love of God that took the children in his arms and prayed for them when they were shooed away by the disciples. His love attracted him. It drew him like a magnet to Calvary. It drew him to deal with the extent of human sin, it attracted him to the sacrifice that was necessary for our sin, for our salvation, for our forgiveness. Think of it as John might have left the Mount of Human Nature like he was beginning to figure it out. And he might have said, There are souls which easily bestow grace. There are people who say, ah, oh, don't, oh, I forgive them. And, and, and John's thinking about that, and he says, there are souls which easily bestow grace. Hard to forgive, but they have a dim perception of the majesty of the truth which has been violated. To take the life of another human being made in the image of God has a majesty, has a majestic dimension to it, has an honor to it that's beyond what a lot of people see, beyond what they're easy to forgive. All, uh, yeah, I remember when the people went in and forgave, uh, uh, the, uh, the Pope went in and forgave the guy that shot him. And so, uh, that, yeah, they, they did it. But I, I don't think they understand. I don't, and John, I think, would have said, they don't understand the majesty and the glory of a human soul. 
There are souls which have a clear perception of the majesty of truth and a deep sense of the sin that swerves from it, but they are inexorable, they're impossible in their justice and unable to pardon. So there are people who, who I understand the crime, but cannot ever redeem, cannot ever pardon it. Blending of the extreme. Truth. The fullness, the entireness of grace and the entire forgiveness. And there's a sense of wrong which is forbidding because there's no sense of forgiveness. But in Jesus, perfect forgiveness is joined with perfect perception. The glory of Christ's love is that it comes not from darkness, but from light. He forgave the sinner because he bore the sin. See, we're accustomed to hear the words grace and truth. And we hear them stereotypically used in religion as a tradition or as a condemning law. But those who listened to Jesus, like John, saw these words as something to marvel at. They were gracious words that proceeded from the lips of Jesus. And the overall impression that John had and the overall dynamic that those that actually listened and heard Jesus was the impression not of a speculative teacher, not of someone that had learned something and is now expounding it to students, but as someone who had a sincere and earnest desire to seek and discover the lost and pay for their salvation. Jesus walked through cornfields when he was hung hungry. He sat by a well in Samaria with a distraught woman. He spoke from a boat near the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he gathered crowds together on the slopes of those hills in Galilee. And he fed them. Never did Jesus come across merely as a teacher of doctrine. Never did he come across as an expounder of the articles of belief. He was always a power. He was always a force in human life, a force of practical and real grace and truth that were power, powers for real practical living. Grace, someone said, Grace is power, the power whereby, the power whereby God works in nature is called power. That power whereby he works in the will of a human being, where he works in the wills of his reasonable creatures, that power is called grace. That's what John said happened to him before he came and got saved. That's grace. Another person said grace is a force in the spiritual order, not simply God's unmerited kindness in the abstract, but such kindness in action as a movement of his spirit within the soul, resulting from the incarnation and the imparting to the will and the affections a new capacity of obedience and love. That's what God's doing by grace. Grace is not simply kindly feeling on the part of God, but a positive boon conferred on man. Grace is a real and active force. It is the power that works in us, illuminating the intellect, warming the heart, strengthening the will, and redeeming humanity. It is the might 
of the Everlasting Spirit, capital S, the Everlasting Spirit, renovating man by uniting him to the sacred manhood of the Word incarnate. Grace is a revelation of the will of God now. It comes into you, and it comes from the Holy Spirit within you. It's a revelation of the will of God. Now, grace is everything a sinner needs. Grace is found in Jesus Christ. The mind and will of God toward the sinner are found in Jesus. They are found in the Jesus that John knew and loved because Jesus first loved him. Truth, we live in a generation of paint, varnish, veneer, and false fronts. It's sold on the internet every day to suckers. I'm not a sucker. Well, use it for a week and you'll find out. It's often found when we talk about that thing Pastor Stevenson talked about, character. We often try to pass ourselves off as something greater than we actually are or better than we actually are or wiser or more learned or more beautiful or more humble, holy, full of grace and on and on and on and on. Truth in Christ was truth in a real man. They're going through the combines for the NFL now. These are for real men. But I already read for a couple of, for a couple of them they got hurt. So, But anyway, Christ was a real man, not a veneer. Jesus was and is and will always be genuine, real, solid, all the way to the core. Jesus is at heart what he is at the surface. It's often said that you never know a man until you tell him no. Want to find out what your child is like? Tell him no. Want to see a tantrum? Tell some of the children no. Not all of them. Some of them take out an AK and do you in. And so... So here is a G. He's always the same. You never know what a man really is until you see him in a crisis. Or you see him at an elevated state of excitement. But if anything, when we see Jesus at his trial, in his condemnation, a legal condemnation, we see him carrying his cross toward Calvary. If we see anything, we see the real Jesus in the flesh. He was sincere. He told his disciples starting at Caesarea Philippi that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to be condemned, that he was going to be killed. And you know the story, Peter said, no, 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 that can't happen, that can't happen. And over, over and over, at least three occasions that came down. But he was sincere. He wasn't talking for effect. He wasn't just talking for, for mood or, or to stir something. He wasn't just talking. He said, literally, this is what's going to happen. And he also said, and I am going to do this. I am going to do this. And he did all of it to the end. James and John came to him and asked, Can we be seated on the right and left when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus answered, Well, that's not for me. That's for the Father to decide. But besides that, can you do? what I'm going to do. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you drink it all the way to the bottom, to the dregs? Can you do that? 
can you do it all the way to the bottom? And Jesus never professed that he could do something he couldn't do. He never professed to be something he was not. Jesus on Calvary drank the cup all the way to the dregs, right down to the very bottom. He said, finally, it is finished. What he came to do, to seek and to provide salvation to the lost, he finished on Calvary. And today, he continues to intercede continually for anyone who will, who will come to him in faith and simply believe. Listen to me. God became visible. The source of all truth. That very God that became human can shine into your heart, into your soul. In Jesus Christ, we can have the complete satisfaction, the genuine happiness, not a veneer, not a falsehood, the pure knowledge. Listen, there is one God. There is one reality. There's one necessary relationship, and that is your relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came and died in our place for our salvation. The glory, John chapter 1. John in chapter 1 is giving us the impression and the reality of what he saw. Listen, what he saw, what he listened to, what he touched, what he knew personally. In John chapter 1, we have an authoritative experience. It's not an experience from someone else, not an experience that he read about or got third hand, not an experience that was a rumor down through the rumor mill, but someone he actually listened to, heard, touched, ate with, spent the nights with, traveled with, and knew personally. His experience John's experience with certain issues pressed upon him, pressed into his very being truths and realities about Jesus. And the conclusion that he came to, the Word has been made flesh. That's the heart and core of the matter. It's a conclusion we all have to come to regarding Jesus. Every cult doesn't come to that conclusion, nor the concomitant conclusion, he was God the Father. It's the conclusion we must come to regarding God and Jesus. The conclusion we have to come to concerning creation and eternity. The conclusion we have to come to regarding destiny and heaven. God was manifested in the flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. We're talking about believing and never denying what he had seen and heard all through the end of his youth to his very old age. You know, people put more credibility on Shakespeare, who has no eyewitness. Than they do Jesus Christ, who we know had upward of 500 that saw him alive and well after his crucifixion. John's experience included being with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, where he was transformed. And John witnessed the two greatest events ever, the resurrection and the ascension to heaven. How could John, one of the first at the tomb, 
one of the first people, one of the first disciples who saw him raised up to heaven, one of the first to acknowledge that he was genuinely dead at the crucifixion? How could John not be a witness and a testimony to those things? How could he not say something? How could he not how could he ever 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 be quiet? And in a similar way, how can you and I being born again and redeemed fail to be a witness to Jesus of sin and the new life that Jesus gives? John, the apostles, the others, they found him true and gracious. He wasn't somebody that lived a, a more holy life than they did. He wasn't somebody that was smarter than they were. He wasn't just a level above human beings. He was God, veiled in human flesh and blood. The vision or what they saw was no glimpse. Moses on the mountain, God hit him in the cleft of the rock, and he barely saw the backside of God for a moment. He got a glimpse and was transformed. These people lived with and traveled with Jesus is no glimpse. They knew him when he experienced the changeableness and the uncertainties of human existence. They saw him. They saw how he reacted. They saw how he handled things. They saw how he handled the mocking and the, and the cursing and the swearing that came his way. They saw him how he handled the beating. They saw him how they handled it. How he handled it. They saw how he handled it when people mobbed him and cried out, Hosanna, 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 and, and, and wanted to make him the king. They saw everything that he went through. No glimpse. And they saw him die. Jesus was not one of many. Jesus was, was the one the one unique, only one like it, Son of God. It was not somebody very religious. Religious crowd of that day had seen many, many, many people that claimed to be religious. Jesus was a disclosure, an unveiling of God. They could not refrain from speaking about it. In Jesus was the very beginning of, of meaning and being to us. In Jesus, the very beginning and being of what humankind is. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He's the great secret of God. No man has seen God at any time. The Son, the only begotten, the one unique eternal Son, has declared God the Father. They could not refrain speaking, and they understood Listen, they understood their testimony would enkindle men to a passion and a loyalty. And not only to that, but to a passionate anger, jealousy, and fear. But they spoke anyway. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. It's a great blessing to be in the house of God and to be part of Christ's body. And when you get baptized, that's what you're declaring. I'm a part of Jesus Christ. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We appreciate your faithfulness this morning. I've spoken very briefly on the humanity of Christ. It's such an astounding, astounding truth astounding truth but it's possible that this morning you're here and you haven't fully grasped what we're talking about we're talking about the one who died and rose again 
because he was God who came in the flesh to seek you and save you. If you're one of the many who do not know Jesus Christ, listen to me. Grace and truth. In Jesus, you get the grace and truth. You get the power to live a new life. You get the power to be born again, and that's a very profound truth. To be born again means you get to start without the baggage of your past and live a new life in Jesus Christ. And you can have that this morning. That can belong to you. That can be part of your life. And Jesus will help you and change you. You're not saved this morning. You're not born again this morning. Then Jesus really is the answer. And it doesn't matter what the question is. Jesus is the answer. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. I'd like to pray with you. If you're not right with God, your heart's not right with God this morning. If you'd simply slip up your hand and say, Pastor, preacher, would you pray for me? God sees these young men raising their hand. God's dealing with you. God's dealing with you. You need Jesus in your life. Would you quickly slip up your hand? I want to take time to remember you in prayer because this is the issue in life. It's a crucial issue. And God will help you. Front to back and side to side one last time. You are within the sound of my voice and you want God to, to come in and help you, change you, transform you. Praise God. Okay, this morning, let's stand as a congregation. I'm going to sing a chorus. I want to open the altars, uh, the altar area. So if you want to pray, uh, call on Jesus this morning, you can feel free to do that. Uh, let's sing this chorus. Uh, for, he Lord. for He is Lord. Let's sing it. Let Him be the Lord of your life. For He is Lord. He is Lord. risen from the dead and he is Lord and my knee shall bow every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord Let him rule and reign. He's my Lord. He has risen from the dead. And he's my Lord. And my knees shall bow. And my tongue confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Would you give the Lord a clap offering right now? Father, we do love you, worship and adore you, and thank you, Father God, for your grace, your loving kindness, your mercies, your mercies on mercies, the Lord God. We thank you for all of your goodness. Amen.
Don't ever let it be. Well, of course, he's God. His grace and truth is there to empower you to a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Remember baptism tonight. Come and be a part of that with us. Uh, and uh, it'll be a great, great event. Uh, uh, next, uh, or this coming week uh, is the uh, Pioneer Rally. Joe Campbell, Greg Mitchell, Mark Olson, Ram uh, Ram uh, Ramon Gutierrez, and Paul Stevens will be preaching that. And so there's a flyer in the back for that. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Uh, Ed Kuhlman, would you ask God's blessing? Amen. <coughs>